Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the Pacific West Coast in Canada. I hope everybody is having a lovely week. I hope you're all healthy and strong. Welcome Devlet Beck. Hi Mal. Hi Marjona. Banda. Good to see many of you in the class. Marjona, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking how I'm doing today. Um, students, in this class we are looking at IELTS listening part three and part four, the more challenging parts of the listening section. We're going to be focusing on hearing uh, difficult answers and I will give you some strategies and tips as we do this, as we work uh, through these two listening uh, parts together. Uh, this lesson and these materials are coming from our websites from aehelp.com for academic IELTS and for general IELTS it's generalieltshelp.com or more simply gieltshelp.com. You have six full practice exams on these websites along with uh, our um, interactive course, of course the speaking that you just saw us do in the previous class as well. Uh, so we've got help for all sections. Click that big red button to join our premium package. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access and it doesn't cost a lot of money. So it's really worth your investment uh, when you're preparing for the IELTS exam. Our general IELTS looks like this with the green background at gieltshelp.com. Again, click this big red button to join the premium package there. Uh, we do have the most popular learning materials for IELTS in the world. We help thousands and thousands of students every single day. Our apps, Academic IELTS Help and General IELTS Help, you can get them from your app store and you can link them to the websites. Academic IELTS Help links to A Help, General IELTS Help links to G IELTS Help and uh, you can uh, use our materials anywhere, anytime. Um, and um, we do have the world's most advanced online IELTS course. Um, again, if you have questions, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com. We've got lots of classes for you this week, so we've got uh, Two more classes tomorrow and two more classes on Saturday as well. So make sure to follow these live classes, pay attention to the schedule, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Instagram uh, to follow the schedules there. Uh, students, um, again, this class today, um, this is... Um, a continuation from the listening that we started last week. So we did part one and part two uh, last week. Does anybody remember um, what part one and part two were about? Okay. Um, all right. I'm render, don't worry about it, I'll get you next class, okay? I'll keep an eye out for you. All right, okay. So what were the listening topics for the um, part one, part two of the last class? Okay, Cass says it was a tour of a resort, that was part two, and part one was a student registering for their classes. Very good, Bakrat, absolutely. So part one was Registration, yep, let me just go back there. I was just curious to see if you remembered. So part one uh, was um, here and uh, this is our fourth exam. This was a student registering for their exam. And then part two was about a tour of a resort. Um, part three and part four, does anybody remember what those will be about? So part three, and again, remember you're doing this during the interview time. You can uh, look at the topic of part two. Part two was something about zoos, right? So think about zoos and zoo animals and 
interesting questions or ideas around zoos. And then part four, Simran is saying, will be something about a turtle. Yeah, everybody seems to remember that turtle really uh, well, which is great. Okay, so let's do this, students. Let's get into part three. We're going to do the listening right away. Um, if you have his headset, use it, okay? So for our listening, we're going to hop over to our website. And um, this is going to be CD4 track three. Okay, we're gonna use our academic for this, but uh, it's the same in the general because the listening section is the same for academic and for general. So on our website, let's get into our audio CDs. And uh, here are all the audio CDs that you get with our premium package. I think there's like 50 or so, and we're adding more this year. So uh, let's go to CD4 track three, everybody. Let's get ready to listen. Now, while you listen, answer the questions, okay? In the IELTS, you're answering while you're listening. Try to visualize. So try to see yourself in a zoo. Try to picture that you are walking around a zoo, looking at the different zoo exhibits, you're looking at the tigers, the elephants, the monkeys, okay? And really try to connect the information with what you know. Um, here we go with uh, part three. Listen, answer. Don't put the answers in the chat. Let's share them after so that everybody gets a fair chance. Um, okay, so here we go, everyone. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired ends in life. Clearly these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. 
Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point. But such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes, but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, and in that half minute, you should check uh, your answers. Let me just stop the audio on the website here before it starts off on section four or they call it part three and part four since 2020, 21. Um, okay, everyone, let's go through these answers together and then I will explain a little bit of what I was doing um, while listening and give you a bit of strategy on how to really catch those more challenging questions, um, especially when you have uh, three different accents as you had in this case. So I'm not sure if uh, any of you realized, but um, the host here, was British, the female professor was Canadian, and the male professor was from New Zealand. Okay, so you had a British, Canadian, and New Zealand accent in this listening, and that can be fairly challenging, but that is English because English is the international language. So you have to be used to listening, or you have to get used to listening to different accents, okay? <clears throat> All right, so, uh, the beginning here um, was a fairly easy lead-in. You, when you see names like Dr. Henry Gergen and Dr. Gloria Mesto, um, it's pretty easy to catch the answers um, because they're names, so they're not really paraphrasing as much. They're not giving as many synonyms um, when they're explaining this. Uh, what's really important to also pay attention to is who is who because when you have this kind of um, a start here, okay, it's a, there's a very good chance that they're going to refer to these different speakers throughout the listening. So really uh, pay attention to who is who, okay, as these speakers will be referenced um, in the 
uh, rest of this part, okay? How can you do that? Like, how can you really kind of think about who is who? And, and that happens in this case, okay? So I'm giving you strategy here um, when you have this kind of listening where there's multiple speakers and they're talking about them, like Dr. Smith, Dr. John, and Dr. Anne, right? <clears throat> so, um, oh, <laughs> and Mian is like, you're showing the class the schedule. <laughs> Thanks, me, for helping me out there. Okay, so let me cut back here. All right, so uh, good that I caught that early. All right, artist says we can't see it. Okay, um, okay. so uh, let me get back to this. Yeah, I, I got really excited about showing you guys this, so I wasn't really paying attention to what you're seeing. All right, so back to this. So uh, again, um, we're talking uh, about zoos here. It's a discussion between you know these speakers here. Um, and I'm sure you got the answers for this. So you got that Dr. Henry Gergen, the answer was A from um, University of Edinburgh. And um, uh, Dr. Gloria Mesto was B uh, from Trinity College. Okay. And I, I think that this was quite clear you have person a person b okay they don't want you to get this question wrong in the IELTS. they want you to get this question right because when you get this right you will be able to get other questions right as well so um number for for this question for 21 one is a two is b in your answer sheet if you're doing the paper-based um test it'll look like this so there'll be question 21 and you go one a uh, to uh, B, okay? You can do it like that, and then you'll get the correct answer. All right, so again, let me get back to this really important point here. So you have to really pay attention to who these speakers are, okay? Um, and because the again the speakers will be referenced and you do see that like later on a really good tip is you see their names in the question like you see while zoos do conserve animal life dr. Henry Gergen argues right okay um, according to dr. Gergen right so how can you like when you hear these names of these speakers how can you trick your mind or how can you help your mind to better remember who is who and really just be very quick about this, okay? What do you think? So what do you think? What's a good trick to use in this kind of listening? I mean, you should be doing this in all active listening, but how do you do that? Okay, so, uh, by male or female names okay yeah so we identify that this is a male name right and uh, we identify that uh, Gloria is a female name uh, sometimes it's not that easy because they only give you the family names like Dr. Mesto and Dr. Gergen okay so it's female sure what else yeah Tatiana very good very very smart okay so look at what Tatiana is saying Tatiana is saying imagine what they look like okay All right, so imagine what they look like. Like you might imagine that Dr. Henry Gergen is this small round man with glasses. And then uh, you might visualize that uh, Dr. Gloria Mesto is this uh, taller, uh, skinnier woman with long black hair, right? So you visualize um, what they look like. You actually give a picture. Use your professors. So pick a professor who you know um, that's female, that you've seen, that you've studied under. Uh, pick a male professor and then imagine that that's uh, Gergen, that's Mesto, and then you'll be much, much better. Okay, all right. So everybody got that tip. So adding um, physical images to the speakers is really helpful in understanding the rest of the audio okay so add uh, physical visual features to the speakers 
so you can associate and um, utilize their information better. Okay. All right. So um, that's that's what you want to do. That's going to help you. Okay. Now, uh, question twenty-two to twenty-four. Uh, which three of the arguments are given against zoos? So who is the person talking against zoos? Okay. So which of the two professors is kind of like, uh, zoos aren't really all that good. Okay. Is it the tall, skinny, dark haired woman or is it the shorter, plump man wearing glasses? Which one is it? Okay. So who is it? Yeah, Buckrat says it's Dr. Gergen. It's the male speaker, right? Arda says the man. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the man. All right. Okay, so when you're trying to figure out this kind of question, and we call this kind of like a multi... Um, multi multiple choice uh, question um, the way to solve these questions is to use logic and take notes okay so those are the two really important points to pay attention to use logic and take notes okay so here, I wasn't taking notes. Hopefully some of you were. Um, what were the three correct answers to this one? Let's see if anybody's got them. All right. Nutan says A, B, and F. So animals are treated inhumanely by uh, zoos. Yes, he says that, right? Dr. Gergen says they're treated inhumanely. Um, and then he does say animals are persons. So by persons in this case, we mean that they're living, feeling beings, just like a person um, that has, you know, feelings. So if you lock an animal behind a cage, it will get frustrated, it will get depressed, it will become sad. And we can see that in zoos, okay? Um, and then, um, yes, uh, the speaker says verbatim, he says they are fundamentally wrong. So there's, they're just not the right way to house animal. Okay. And Cass says, yeah, instead of saying uh, wrong, he uses a different word. It's paraphrased as unethical. Okay. So you can't just take an animal from the forest or the savanna that has done nothing to you and put them in a cage and make them suffer because you want to look and point and smile at them. Um, so he says they are fundamentally wrong. Okay. All right. Um, or in fact, uh, as Cass says, they say fundamentally unethical or Dr. Gergen says that. Okay. Um, and then you had questions 25 to 27. So this is where you had to fill in the blanks. Um, and here you're really paying attention. So a tip for this one is really focus on the words that come before and after the space. Okay, a lot of um, students uh, focus on this, uh, on these words here, must be held too, but they don't really focus on the words that come after the blank, which is this here. So make sure to uh, focus on both of those. Must be held to something. It's going to be a noun, I can tell by that, of animal treatment. And if I'm focusing on that, I can kind of catch this. Um, anybody catch what number 25 was? Must be held to. Bakrat says high standard. Um, Mian says higher standard. Okay, almost. And Irfan says higher standards. Yeah, so the correct answer here is higher standards. The S is very important, everyone. If you did not get the S, you will get it wrong. Um, why do we 
uh, why do we know that this is higher standards? Why do we have know that this is a plural? This has to be a plural. If you don't put higher standards, if you don't put the S, you'll get it wrong. Why? Okay, so some of you almost got it. It was a tricky one. It was um, more difficult. It's DS, Arda, standard. It's S, standards. The reason it's standards um, is not just because of zoos, uh, but also because there's no a uh, and it's accountable. Okay, so no a. Uh, uh. Uh, and standards are countable. Uh, so yeah, zoos kind of helps you for sure. I think zoos definitely gives you a hint that it should be a plural. And so it should be a uh, plural and also that you don't see a, uh, so it's not countable. Um, or sorry, it's not counted if there's no a, uh, right? If there's no a, uh, it's gonna be plural. I hope that makes sense. Okay, that was a bit confusing, but. Uh, countable nouns, if you do not see the article a uh, or un, you should be thinking, okay? So here's a, let me put it to you this way. Think about it like this, students. Um, if you realize, and you don't have to do this while you're listening, you can do this during the time that you're checking your answers or at the very end of the listening when you have a few minutes to check your answers. So if you realize that the blank is a noun you must consider if it is a count or non count noun and look for the articles a or un in the question okay it's important yeah, everybody got that? Okay. So if you see a uh, or un, it's definitely a singular. If you don't see a uh, or un and it's countable, then it's going to be a plural, right? So if you see the articles, then it will be a singular noun. Don't write a plural or you'll get it wrong. If you do not see the articles, um, then it will be uh, with an S as long as it is countable. Okay, all right, everybody says they've got it, which is good. Okay. All right, so really pay attention to that. Okay. All right, number 26, let's do this one. So while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues, so here I know that I'm waiting for the male voice. Okay, sometimes it took a bit, like sometimes the answers come quickly and sometimes you might have to wait. Okay, one very common question that our students ask is like, how often do the questions come? Like, is the answer coming every 10 seconds? Is it every 15 seconds? There's no pattern, students. Sometimes the answers will come quickly, like two or five seconds apart. Sometimes you have to wait 20 seconds for the next answer. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, so instead you have to visualize and you have to pay attention to the content. Here we're waiting for the male voice. Um, and while zoos do conserve animal life, you have to wait a long time here. You have to wait like a minute. Um, and this function could also be performed by animal. Yeah, very good, Marjona. Um, good job, Arda. Good job, ja uh, Jaquin. Uh, it's animal preserves. Okay. Right. They say animal preserves uh, quite a few times. So uh, really pay attention to redundant nouns as these <clears throat> will most likely at least be at least 
one of the answers. Okay, so if you're missing some answers, if you're confused, if you get lost a little bit, but you hear like a, a certain noun or noun collocation being repeated again and again and again, write it down because it's probably one of the answers, okay? So um, I think they said animal preserves like five or six times. They're like, well, animal preserves do the same and animal preserves this and animal preserves that. So is everybody clear on that tip? It's not a guarantee that it's an answer, but there's a very good chance that when you hear a noun several times repeated, that it's going to be uh, one of the answers. Everybody clear on that? Okay. So uh, really pay attention to redundant nouns. Okay. Um, the example here is animal preserves animal uh, preserves uh, was repeated about five, six times. Okay, all right. Um, no name says, I wrote preserved. Yeah, unfortunately it's not gonna be correct. It's called an animal preserve. Okay, and again, it's countable. Okay, um, this answer came really quickly. Uh, this one was really fast. So number 27, um, enjoyment and something are two key positive attributes of uh, zoos. Uh, what was that one? Arda Bakrat, very good. Um, Jacqueline, make sure you only write education because they give you enjoyment. Okay, so in your answer key, only education. Cass says education, but Dita agrees. Irfan is there. Yeah, education. Now, um, this is capitalized because it's the first word in the sentence, but this one should just be a common noun. So um, just lowercase, okay? It's okay if you write all uppercase or all lowercase, but be careful with your pronunciation. If you write education, I'm not sure. They might give it to you, but they might mark it wrong. I wouldn't risk it. I would just write education all lowercase, okay? All right, everyone, let's keep putting along. Um, so slow and steady wins the race. Pay attention, don't rush, don't jump around, right? Multiple choice, you're really just paying attention to the multiple choice. And um, here um, I did uh, write down some notes, okay? Um, just like that multi multiple choice, you write down notes for this. So here, um, again, I'm listening for the male speaker. It's Dr. Henry Gergen. And Dr. Henry Gergen says, oh, I'm not sure, I'd have to think about it. So I wrote down the notes. Maybe I, if I'm not fast enough, I just got the words, I'm not sure. And then here, if you look at C, he says, oh, he's not sure, right? And look at all those C's coming up. Me, Dublat Beck, Riza, tons of C's, which is good. You got that, right? So he says, I'm not sure. Very good. And the answers are coming very fast here for these multiple choice question. Uh, what is the interesting question? Um, whether or not uh, the inspiration uh, or inspirational value outweighs the bad, okay? So that was the interesting uh, question. I remembered that. Um, hopefully I'm fast enough to write some notes around that as well. Uh, okay, and then here we go. Whether zoos are ethical, whether the inspiration value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects. That's uh, almost exactly what I wrote. So whether enjoyment, inspiration. Okay, so B is the right answer here. So if you got B, that's superb. And then number 30, uh, what do the guests agree on? And I got the notes here. So uh, zoos need to improve their conditions. Uh, zoo conditions need to be improved. And Bakrat and Sarabjit uh, immediately agreed with me, which is really good. Marjona and Nutan also did as well. So A, very nice students. Okay, so for these last 
uh, multiple choice questions. You're listening for the answer. You're taking some notes in the computer-based exam. Use that piece of paper that they give you. Because if you're just staring at the answers, uh, it might not, you know, you might not catch it and then you get lost in the audio and you get confused. So just write it down, write down what the answer is. Pay attention to the question and write down the answer real quick when you hear it. Okay, that's the trick, All right? So for multiple choice questions, uh, pay close attention to the question and write down in two to three words the answer as you hear it rather than staring at the choices. Um, the reason why too is even if you miss it or even if you write down the wrong answer um, and you're like, whoa, none of those answers are the same as mine, uh, you will still have a chance to find that right answer later on, okay, when you review your answers and when you're transferring your answers to the answer sheet. So don't panic, okay? Sorry, Jeet says I scored 9 out of 10. That's fantastic. Okay, everyone, so let's get into part 4 or section 4, I should say. Uh, this is going to be about turtles, right? So visualize the turtle. Everybody's got that turtle. Can somebody throw me a... A turtle emoji so everybody's got the <laughs> when you're thinking about visualizing it try not to just see like a simple drawing like an emoji that's 32 by 32 pixels but try to um, you know see lots of details so see the actual real living turtle as much as possible Carolina thank you for that turtle emoji Simran's got some okay there we go now we've got it everybody's got the turtle in their head we're listening to a story about Turtles. Okay, so here we go, everyone. Um, let me cut back again to my um, audio here on the website. Again, this audio is coming from aehelp.com where you can get six full practice exams with, included with our course. So it's really worth spending a couple of dollars to get all this fantastic material. And uh, free materials are okay, but paid materials are the best especially when you're doing something as important as the IELTS. Um, here we go, everyone. So listening section four, get ready to listen. We'll share the answers after the audio. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot, with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometer per hour, 
This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey, not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveller. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about 1 in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, let's stop this audio. Um, this is a typical kind of section four. Um, when I did the IELTS exam, it was using pesticides in Australia and it was a lecture very much like this, just on a different topic. So it's fast, it's continuous, there's no breaks. Um, and it's the same for academic and for general IELTS. There's no difference. Uh, academic general IELTS candidates are listening to the exact same audio um, as the other group. So. Uh, so keep that in mind. Okay, um, we're going to hop back now to our uh, section four here and go over the questions together. I tried to give you a little bit of insight and help by kind of following along and highlighting gently um, as the as the audio went along. So here, you know, I was high highlighting the key words that the uh, speaker was using, like loggerhead turtle, seek dry land, lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of, what was the answer here? So it was a word, it was the name of a very popular American state. Um, Dat Kyo Tien says that was Florida with a capital F, yes. Very good, has to be a capital F because uh, it's the name of the state, so the state of Florida. So the sandy beaches of Florida provide the perfect location for nesting, yeah. You gotta write it with capital, not small. Big F, big F, small F, you get it wrong. Okay, after hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is safer than the shore because it has fewer what? <coughs> Excuse me. So it has fewer what? Again, remember the tip that I gave you uh, just uh, in the last section? You hear this word over and over again, and this was again a noun that they used again and again. <laughs> Arda says, bless you. Thank you, Arda. Uh, predators. Yeah, that's right. So predators is correct. Uh, again, plural, right? Because it's countable and fewer tells you that it has to be an S, predators, okay? All right, um, Andy, Shri, you shouldn't miss that one because they said predators like three or four times. So if you're like, okay, I missed it, but I heard them say predators like three or four times, it's probably a good uh, inference in this case. The turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers. Now, because we have kilometers here, we know that this is a number. 
So, um, and it was 13,000. Nuthan, it can't be 30,000 because 30,000 would be like around the world, right? I mean, the turtle's not swimming around the world, so it's 13,000. If it helps, put the comma in there. Um, okay. So 13,000, you just need the number. Don't write 13,000 with words, but just write 13,000, the number. One, three, zero, zero, zero. Don't make mistakes with your zeros, otherwise you'll get it wrong. Okay, two zeros, wrong. Four zeros, wrong. You need three zeros. All right, um, while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extremely something. Okay, this was an adjective here. Um, what was the answer here? Simran says sluggish. Yeah, sluggish means slow. Okay, like the slug, the animal, slug. Very slow. Right? That was kind of like a worm, more than a slug, but <laughs> that's the idea anyway. Um, anybody uh, a snail or a slug emoji? I, I always use, when I did the classes in the past, I used to love when people put that snail emoji into the chat. But uh, a snail <clears throat> and a slug, uh, they're little creatures. A uh, snail has a little house on its back. Um, a slug is the same as a snail, but without the little house. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Marjona. Look at all those snails. So those are snails because they have a house. If they don't have a house on their back or a shell, we should say, uh, then they are a slug. <laughs> all right. So there, now you've got me smiling. Um, all right. Uh, so the entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. Amrinder says two years. Um, Amrinder, even easier and faster, the number, and two years, like that. Okay, two years, very good. Two years of continuous swimming. Okay, let's keep going. So this was a paragraph completion. You really had to visualize, pay attention, keep the speed, right? No more than two words and or a number for each answer. As incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a something. Now, you, this is really confusing if you are thinking Disney, Finding Nemo, uh, because they give you false information, but it's solitary. Yeah, they, they travel alone. They're solo, solitary, alone, okay? Solitary is the adjective, solitary traveler, okay? Traversing, traversing means crossing, traversing the open ocean on its own for years at a time. Can you imagine that? It's a, when I go swimming, and I like swimming, but I do get bored after about eh, 30, 40 minutes of continuous swimming. <laughs> Can you imagine swimming for two years by yourself? I hope they have like a waterproof uh, MP3 player or something that they can listen to music um, at least while they're doing that. It'd be a happier turtle um, but yeah some animals are like that I guess they're they're solitary and the turtle swims for two years solo I wonder what's going on in their little heads when they're swimming for that long by themselves but anyway um, okay uh, for years at a time scientific research has in recent years uh, told us that it is through a connection with the earth something that the turtles find their way two words getting a little bit more challenging Simran says that was in magnetic fields bulls and kraken agrees it was magnetic field common noun it's not a name uh, with the earth's magnetic field that the turtles find their way around the ocean for example the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of the coast of uh, definitely some kind of a noun coming up for location off the coast of um, iPad uh, is asking why is it 17,000 uh, hours correct because it's the word approximately in the previous one okay the word approximately tells you that okay this one's Portugal 38 Portugal off the coast of Portugal makes them change their direction and head for North West Africa so they're going for Africa imagine swimming from 
Florida to Africa. Uh, possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense its something and longitude. Now, if you know this, these are kind of the lines that go around the world that we use to kind of position ourselves, right? So longitude, latitude. Make sure you don't write longitude again like I almost did. Okay, latitude. So latitude, longitude. Longitude, latitude. Okay. Or sorry, longitude, latitude. Okay, um, now here, last question 40. Choose the correct letter A, B, or C. Approximately what percentage of hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground in Florida? I remember they said one in 4,000 make it back. I have to do a little bit of math here. Okay, so... Um, one in four thousand equals zero point zero two five percent. Okay, so the correct answer here is A. Such a small percentage. It's like winning the lottery. If you're if you're born as a loggerhead turtle in your next life, um, the chances of you swimming to Africa from Florida and going back to Florida, it's basically like winning a good lottery pot or a jackpot at a casino. Ooh, that's a I I love turtles, but I hope I'm not going to be a loggerhead turtle in my next life. That's a it's <laughs> a very discouraging <laughs> ratio of. Uh, Success. We were talking about success in life and part three speaking there in the last class. I would say being a loggerhead turtle is often a very unsuccessful um, outcome <laughs> in life. But uh, all right, students, so jokes aside, that's what happens. Um, how did you all do? So what did you get? What was your overall score? Um, especially if you were here in today's class and yesterday's class, then you can kind of figure out your overall score from 40. If you use our websites, and I highly recommend using our websites, that's where we were just now for the audio. At the very, very bottom, let me just do a super zoom in here. Um, super zoom in. Uh, there's this score calculator. You see that? It's right, uh, right over there. Uh, score calculator. So you click on that score calculator and then um, it will ask you to uh, give your listening score out of 40. So uh, if you were here for that first listening class last week, um, Nuthan, I obviously was, Nuthan says I got 35. So Nuthan, you, you would get a band uh, eight, okay, if you got 35, right? Uh, Tatiana says 31 out of 40. So Tatiana, 31 would be a band seven. Okay, if you don't hear number 38, Tatiana, you gotta take a guess, okay? If it's a spelling mistake, Eagle Eye, you gotta mark it wrong. IELTS will mark it wrong, okay? Right? Um, let's see, anybody else? Cass says 33. 33 is 7.5, Buckrat 29. 29 is a 6.5. Five, very good. Okay, um, and then by the way, if you're using reading, um, academic reading, make sure you use the academic website because it's different for general. Uh, so use the websites. Uh, the websites have tons of information, everyone. So and tons and tons of uh, help uh, for you. You have computer-based practice exams, lots of them. Um, then you have a full online course, lots of interactive slides there. Uh, you have workbooks, PDFs that you can download. You have a whole bunch of lesson videos that you can download. You have all these CDs and much, much more. So I uh, use it, um, task one, task two writing. So this is our website for academic IELTS, aehelp.com, generalieltshelp.com looks like this. You join our websites by clicking these big red buttons. They're one-time payment for lifetime access. We are an official IELTS test registration center and certified agents so um, we know what we're doing we're a team of psychologists and experts um, all right everyone so that's it for today's lesson uh, tomorrow i will be back with i believe it's reading and writing 
Um, yeah, so task two for members and reading for everyone. So come back tomorrow to practice more English, more IELTS with me and improving reading and writing skills. Until then, check out our websites. Keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you so much. There were lots of really brilliant answers and uh, good pacing by many students. Very nice, very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, have a lovely day. Uh, if it's late, take a rest. Okay, don't push yourself too, too hard. I'm Adrian. I'm signing out from beautiful Victoria for now. See you all tomorrow. Goodbye.